Yeah. Welcome to I'm Not Joking, the podcast where a behavioral scientist examines what it's like to live a humorous life. Glimpse into the lives of the funniest people in entertainment, business, and science as your host, Dr. Peter McGraw, explores their habits, motivations, and secrets to success. Get ready to fire up your brain and your funny bone. Now, here's your host. Welcome to I'm Not Joking, the podcast that looks at the lives of funny people. I'm Peter McGraw. Today's guest is Luisa Diaz and Jason Zinneman. Luisa is an anthropologist, museum worker, and comedy booker in New York City. She splits her time between making exhibitions and producing and watching comedy shows. She currently books Too Many Cooks, a weekly show in Manhattan, as well as one-off shows at the Knitting Factory in Brooklyn and other venues around New York. Jason writes the On Comedy column for the New York Times. In 2011, he became the Times' first comedy critic. He's the author of the bestseller, Letterman, The Last Giant of Late Night. He's also written The History of the 1970s Horror, the book Shock Value, as well as the Kindle single, Searching for Dave Chappelle. Welcome, Louisa and Jason, who had never met before this podcast. Right. Thank no, you this, for bringing us together. Yeah, thank you. Great to be here. This is, uh, I think it was one of your ideas to do this. I want I, well, yeah. I wanted to meet her. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to meet both of you. I know, <laughs> I know you both, I know and admire both of you from Twitter. Yeah. And I learn a lot from, from reading your, uh, tweets. And so I thought, hey, this would be much more fun to do. And I will do say, uh, Peter, tweeted at me about doing the podcast as though he didn't have my phone number and email address. Uh, so he invited people to invite themselves, in my opinion. Well, if you two weren't working as an anthropologist, museum worker, comedy booker, comedy critic, or writer, what would you be doing? You go Is there anything left? Oh my God, we what would I be doing? Uh, well, I would... I would be a writer of some sort. No, you can't be a writer. I can't be a writer. I can't be a writer. Firemen. I'd fight fires because that's the kind of guy I am. The uh, saving lives. Uh, I don't know. What would I be? That's a tough one. I guess I... No, that's not true. The, 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 um, there was a point in my life when my career was not going well. <laughs> and I was not happy as a, as a journalist and I was doing poorly. And I made the decision, the bad decision that many writers make, almost um, most writers make, which is that they, they say, okay, this isn't going well. I, I'm not making enough money to pay my rent. I'm going to become a lawyer. Uh, and this was a, <laughs> when I look back in my life, this is like the critical moment in my life. It wasn't even that long ago. This was like a decade ago, like maybe nine, eight, nine years ago. And no, actually, I know exactly. It was right before. Yeah, it was about not, maybe 10 years ago. So that, and I took the LSAT and luckily I suck at the LSAT. <laughs> I did poorly. I did badly enough that I, I thought, you know, if I did get into a law school, it would be a terrible one That's and terrible I would be, idea. I have a miserable law job. So I guess I'm just stuck where I am. So, but I mean, if I really couldn't be a writer, I would have probably been a lawyer because I like to argue. Yeah. And it seemed like a stable job. It seemed like a more yeah. responsible job. And in my like limited, you know, world, if I look at my friends, there's people who are either like a disproportionate number or like writers or lawyers. Yeah. Well, it's New York City, right? Yeah. So you have that. Like, did that make you, knowing that your plan B was so terrible? Yeah. <laughs> it really was. Like, you had basically had no plan B. Did it, did you find yourself, did it change the, what you were doing? Like, did you, did you, did it make you approach your work, your craft differently? Because you're like, yeah. oh my God, I neither need to make this work or. Well, I'll say this, you know, I, uh, you know, for a good part of my career, you know, there was the possibility that if I didn't make enough money, I could, I couldn't continue doing it or stay in the city. Mm -hmm. And that I find in retrospect, was actually quite useful. Motivating. Yeah. Because I mean, for, first of all, a lot of my career was spent thinking about money. My, I would, and in my mind, I always had a percentage of my work that was done for money and a percentage of work that was done for, that I, for me. And I, and that percentage changed, right? And uh, as my career proceeded, but also I feel like it made me hustle. In probably, frankly, a way that I don't hustle as much now, but it made me take all sorts of jobs that I wouldn't have normally taken, which some of those turned into really useful jobs. And I met really important people in my life and I was forced to learn new skills. So, um, what would be an example of that? I mean, 
I, I would, you know, I wrote for, I, every kind of publication you can imagine. I guess my one, including like I, one of my first money jobs was to write this, they don't, this job doesn't even exist anymore, but, uh, the back jacket copy for <laughs> books, like for, know. for kind of yeah. hard boil yeah. books. And, and that is like a real, it's like a sales job essentially. And, but it's a very useful skill to learn how to, in a short amount of space, sell this book and accurately portray it to a point. And, you know, that was even, and actually the, the most valuable job I ever had in my life was when I was a, a, a teenager and a kid. Every summer I worked as a telemarketer, <laughs> sell it, which is like the most hated person in the yeah. world. But I like that the one thing I do really well, uh, uh, it turns out I'm embarrassed to say was, was sell subscriptions over the phone. I sold subscriptions <laughs> and that is a job which prepared me better for being a, a, a journalist who interviews than anything else. Cause it, that's a job where you have to, people really don't like you. And yeah. in a short period of time, you have to figure out who you're talking to, win them over, w- yeah. win them over, learn how to talk to wildly yeah. different kinds of people. And, um, Obviously, it's not the same as, as interviewing, but there is, you, you have to interview a, a, a wide, a very, you have, to, being able to interview many different kinds of people is useful. And in the same way, being able to write for many different forms, whether it's Backshack Akabi, whether it's O Magazine, whether it's, you know, ESPN Magazine, all these different forms, whether it's service journalism or it's, it's deep think journalism, it's reporting. That's one thing that I, I take a lot of pride in in my career is that I can work in a lot of different forms and taught me different ways to think. And just as the last one, I think that also is really useful for a critic because the first thing you do as a critic is you have to try to figure out what the artist in front of you is attempting to do and mm. what they're attempting to do is wildly different than it than all everybody else or sure. i mean the range is very different so yeah, it's, so you you really your backup is a telemarketer yes it's really what i have gone back to telemarketing and that's it. I, I'm, I'm always i may retire to telemarket but you know oh, i um i recently watched sorry to bother you have you seen it you know, I'm, I've not seen so it good. and I'm dying to see it. It's, uh, it's, it's whacked. It, it touches a lot of points of what you just I think discussed. so. I'm sure yeah. I could, yeah, no, I'm dying. It's really up my alley. Well, I'm not. It's funny because a lot of the things you said uh, resonated for me, but I weirdly come from a whole different angle in that I really consider myself a uh, work work to live, not live to work person, Mm -hmm. which is something that I don't, that is like, I specifically don't have in common with artists and, you know, creatives, let's say. So I very purposefully made my plan, my fallback, my job, (laughs) the thing I do for money, which is working in museums and making exhibitions. And I always think of it as like, I'm really good at my job. I really like it. Do you think it has a value in society? But it's not tied to my identity. It's not, I didn't grow up thinking this is what I always wanted to do. So when something goes wrong or isn't perfect or whatever, it's fine. We can address it. No problem. It's my job. We'll fix it. It'll be better the next time. So I don't have this thing that writers and comics have of struggling to make money off of the art that they love and that they identify with, right? I don't live under this kind of like pressure of if I don't make money based on my art form, then does that mean I'm not a good artist? You know, that doesn't float over my head constantly. So weirdly, I have now ended up in a place where I guess I work to work because I work the job, I work to pay my bills and, you know, live my life. But I do that so that I have the freedom to work in comedy and so that I have this freedom to not have my creative impulses when it comes to giving artists platforms or recommendations or, you know, getting a spotlight put on them. There is no pressure beyond the fact that I believe in their talent and I think that they can do well for a particular room and that kind of thing. And so now I'm in this weird place where I don't make a living off of comedy, but I feel like I often am like asking people who do make a living off of comedy to live to these very high standards <laughs> that I've <laughs> devised in my own mind. But you know, that's, that's what we do. So as far as a backup. Yeah. What would it be? Strangely, just like Jason, I, my only immediate thoughts are like degrees off of the thing I already do. <laughs> so at first I was like, well, a late night booker is defi- different than like a live uh, booker. You're now you're <laughs> so I was like, well, I could do that. So then you said that doesn't count. So I was thinking, you know, I studied to be an anthropologist, but it was never with the intention to be an anthropologist. Mm-hmm. Anthropology has like a very strange past and it's, uh, has strange uses in modern society. So I didn't necessarily want to work that, but I wanted to think like that and I wanted Mm -hmm. to know what they know. And so anthropologist is the lens through which I view comedy and everything else in my life. 
So I guess I would be an anthropology professor. <laughs> right. <laughs> sure. Like, no. So if not, I'll take Jason's job and I'll be a writer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's so interesting, yeah. though. What do you? What, why? What do you mean when you say uh, anthropology is the lens with which you see comedy? As an aside, I, on my yeah. coffee table, I have a book called How to Think Like an Anthropologist. Oh, wow. wow. I haven't read that. Is it good? Is I don't know useful? yet. Uh, <laughs> so it's sitting there with 12 other books. You got to read it to books. think like us. Yes, well, how to explain it, I guess. Yeah, what would be like, yeah, if you could give like a quick mm-hmm. primer on thinking or being an anthropologist. Sure. Okay, so I would say the quickest first thing is making a very crude distinction between some of the social sciences. So if we say that psychology tends to be bottom up science that starts with the individual and then proceeds up to how society reflects individuals and sociology is the opposite. It takes a top down approach in which society is this powerful thing that creates individuals. Anthropology chooses to observe both at the same time as concurrent effectors on both humans and society. And so it's really just this way of always placing everything you look at within its historical context, social context, cultural context, biological context, and not just looking at it through this like tree root logic of like everything has a single reason and that's where it came from. So my approach to stand up, I was telling you guys earlier about how I started going to a lot of live shows. So what I mean by approach to like an anthropologist was literally I took like a view of the whole land. I wanted to know, I spent probably seven to nine months going to all kinds of different shows to understand what the difference was between them. So I went to open mics, bringers, club shows, theaters, <laughs> like improv. And bringers is you you bring five friends or Bringers is you basically, friends. you pay for your stage time by bringing people and I often see. you also have to pay like $20. Okay. Yeah. So it is important to know the distinctions between these shows because they have <laughs> completely different levels and types of talent who took different paths to being fun. So when people say it's just funny is the only thing that matters, it I think they can't possibly be more wrong <laughs> because funny has a history and funny has a context and funny has a cultural background and all the audience members that come to see it also bring their whole set of cultural values and experiences and knowledge. So to me, it's almost impossible to look at whether it's a scene, a comedy scene in a city or a performer that one would say is like the greatest performer in New York or something like that without considering their context mm-hmm. entirely, their social context, their hierarchy they came through, that kind of thing. And, and so you, you're working on a new project that actually is bringing both of your worlds together, your right. anthropology world and your comedy world. Yeah. And, and a big focus is this notion of hierarchy. Yeah, not, and not just in that stiff way of like, uh, there's a ladder and everybody has to climb up this ladder and get permission from the gatekeepers on this one ladder, but more of this ecosystem, right? Kind of like the American stand-up ecosystem, and that this does not include, let's say, sketch comedians and comedic actors and hosts and talking heads, although some of those people also do stand-up and therefore sometimes go into this context. I would say it's... It's about their origin city, how long they've been doing it. So why they moved to New York or L.A. or a third city that wasn't New York or L.A., how long they lasted there and why they moved to this other one, what the goal was for them in starting stand-up. You know, some of them accidentally got to stand up. Some of them, it was their goal, and then they got derailed by getting a writing job or an SNL position or whatever it may be. So it's not about being like, these are all the steps that you have to go through and like you have to be a five-year comic to do this or anything mm-hmm. like that. But, that sounds more like a how-to kind of book. Like, if you yeah. want to be a stand-up in America, yeah, it's here's how to do it. But it's more of an acknowledgement of like the social networks that make up comedy. So, you know, I think the most obvious social networks is what we call gatekeepers, right? Industry, because you can trace how certain gatekeepers were the gateway for a whole set of comics or a whole style of comedy or something like that. But beneath that, there are social networks about who headliners choose to open for them. Mm-hmm. There's the fact that comics are also gatekeepers who choose who goes on their podcast, who opens for them on their TV shows. They cast, they get to cast the people in their sitcoms, you know, mm-hmm. all of this stuff. And then there is the peer vetting process of like, uh, to me, you know, I think a lot of people in the industry and outside fans are very focused on credits as like a marker of this person is good at their job. I value um, having your peers respect in that same way. So when, when someone says, uh, 
you know, he or she's a comics comic. Not even that that far, but even like, let's say, you know, at the cellar, they mostly operate on recommendations, right? And there's a difference between the comics who recommend somebody every two months and the comic who once a year says, this is a person you should consider. And, you know, for example, I watch a lot of lineups on shows that are booked by comics. And since they tend to book their friends and people that are just like them and in the same level, usually... When, if you know the entire like landscape, the social landscape, then when there's a name on there that is not of their friend group, that to me immediately signals you saw this person somewhere and they made you laugh and you genuinely thought they were funny, so you asked them to do this your This is show. not a favor. This or is friend not a favor. This is not a traded spot. This is you made me laugh and I'd like to put you on my show. So, so I want to ask you a few <laughs> a few questions about this. So, so the first thing that comes to mind is hearing you say this, and, and Jason, please, you're an interviewer, so you can jump in too. And you, <laughs> is what you're describing is essentially an examination of how even when you see things changing mm-hmm. in comedy and a, and um, a reach for diversity and so on, that there are so many informal or, or not formalized yeah. ways that make it difficult to be an outsider and to come up. Well, but you know what? It's not even just difficult because here's an example that might okay. help. So, um, but, well, but am I like, like what you're describing is like if there's all these systems in place, yeah. some of them are designed to make money and some of them are just designed to right. curry favor. Right. And there has to be the acknowledgement of there's also systems outside those systems. Okay. Right. So, what was the example I was going to give you? Oh, crap. I just Sorry. I, no. But I wanted to make sure I understood yeah. th- this point, which uh-huh. is like the fix. There's not an easy fix as a result of right. it because it's happening. But this is um, not just a, I mean, a comedy issue. This is, this is true for the whole world. Sure. Yeah, yeah of course. And you could talk about this in academia. Why, why do people pay... Why do people bribe their way into yeah. these colleges? Now, some of them because it's a status symbol, some they, they think their kids are going to learn right. something. But the probably the most rational reason mm. is you'll meet this set of people yeah. who will then go on and be helpful or useful right. or be a set that can, and that is real capital in yes. whether you're a doctor you or You just reminded me of my example. Oh, go good. Yeah, take, that's, take that's it exactly over. what take it was. Over. So I'm sure you are both familiar, even though you're not a New Yorker, Peter, but there is kind of like, narrative that romanticizes being a stand-up in New York and how difficult it is to move here and do stand-up and live with 17 roommates and all of this stuff, right? But that is not the only reality of people moving to New York City, especially in the last few years, right? So with the, and this is what I mean about you can't separate the bubbles, like you cannot treat cities as silos that aren't affected by comedy in other cities, for example. So as in the last 10 years, these other scenes built up that had some rank and some good talent there, like Denver, mm-hmm. Chicago, New Orleans for a minute, Atlanta, they built up enough talent and had enough platforms where their talent developed skills and got good enough to move to New York and LA, right? But instead of moving by themselves, yeah, they, they went started groups. moving in groups. The Denver... The Denver, Denver gr- moved in groups. Uh, yes, that yeah, was really Chicago fascinating. Chicago moved in a group. New Orleans was probably one of the earliest ones I noticed. It was like Sean Patton, Mark Norman, like a bunch of them. And so what this did is that they kind of created this like safe little nest for themselves because if six of you who already knew each other for five years and watched each other come up, moved to the city at around the same time and then you all start shows and then you all book each other on your shows oh, interesting. and now you can trade spots with other people and your network becomes stronger than having to be around two years until people recognize your face <laughs> you understand me so you know ultimately there was a couple of effects one is it emptied out the talent pool in these other cities yeah, yeah denver's i've seen that that yeah. void. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it doesn't mean that there aren't talented people there, but because it reduced the number so quickly from like seven about to be headliners to one possibly in a year will be a headliner. Now there's less rooms to do, less stages, less people coming out to shows. And there's a stagnation that happens in those cities, mm. right? Until they rebuild that amount. And then the other thing that happens is some comics who weren't really at the level to be performing in New York City get to coast for a few years with their friends. Mm -hmm. 
before they give up or get somebody pregnant <laughs> or decide that their job at whatever <laughs> or that addiction really kicks well. in. Yeah, that addiction. Exactly. There's like a, a lot of reasons. Um, I joke all the time that I watch the. To me, comics and lineups are like my ponies. I wake up every morning and I like see the stats and who's on what lineup and all this kind of stuff. And it is in this way of knowing like this one's going through a breakup. He's probably not. We can't trust him to do well. This one is uh, just got off the wagon for the third time. You should time. start a, a, a betting a, a betting forum. I'll put ten dollars yeah, on uh, um, this one's gonna bomb. A futures. You can have a co- comedy futures yeah, website. Exactly. So so this is what happened. So some of them coasted for a few years, but then ultimately you do get to the point where now like only skill is going to get you farther so then it kind of like sloughs off some of those and they either go back or they stay doing small things in New York and only maybe two or three of that initial group that moved from that city go on to do Netflix specials and be at the cellar and things like that so the same mechanisms ultimately vet people Mm -hmm. But there are alternate ways coming up, which includes like what we were talking about podcast and Mm -hmm. um, YouTube personalities and all these things. But the problem that we're having, I think, is that, and I'm sorry to even jump to this already, but is I think it's that industry, and by that I mean the people who dole out opportunities, not the people who write about them (laughs) after they've received these opportunities, they haven't kept up with the changing patterns and paths and networks that are is going through. And so they're still vetting based on the system of how many credits you have and whether a headliner recommended you. Versus you versus have 50,000 yeah, people exactly. listen to your podcast yeah. and you come into the city and yeah. you can fill but even the room. then, I would caution you against that because being a good podcaster does not equal being a good stand-up. You know what I mean? And like, I'll tell you this. When comics send me tapes, I think there's this feeling and it makes me feel so like we're in 1989 and you're sending me a VHS <laughs> because they really... <laughs> They think, I don't even have a VHS <laughs> player anymore. No they, one does. Yeah. But they send you these like links, and I think the expectation is that you're going to watch it immediately and then make a decision right. about booking them right then and there. And first of all, I don't think any booker does that. Best case scenario, they're like, this was good. They put you on a list of, I will get to you. Right. Once I put somebody on that list, I go to see them live before I, I book them. Because I'm not booking you to do a videotape set. I'm booking you to work a live room. So I'm interested to see you live and in a room similar to mine or even if it's not I understand that this is different would this apply to my room that kind of thing so there's just kind of a disconnect in like all these flourishing of pathways for artists Mm -hmm. and the people who are supposed to be keeping those gates are not paying attention to those so so this is a question for both of you though because you know, I said, oh, you can fill a room, and you're like, but that doesn't mean they're good. And I immediately yeah. thought, I'm, I'm going to put on my marketing yeah. professor hat for I a know, moment. I know, I know, I hate which you is, already. <laughs> this is a business this, that this person is running, yeah. and they want a full room, and sure. they've got a full room, and these are people who are happy to see this person. I mean, Lucy, you're, you're, you work in museums, I know. right? You know, and yeah. so, like, so this notion of art versus commerce right. in the world of comedy seems like it creates constant friction constantly it's and it's really you know you're right you can't like let's say fault a comedy club Jason's making a face no I'm not making, <laughs> not making a face I'm not making a face I, I mean I, I'm wondering if I should argue the. I, I mean I guess my feeling is showbiz is, un, is unfair it always right. has been unfair yeah. it's never been fair it's never a meritocracy and it's never been the case that you know the best always got Louisa is a incredibly what she just said is how bookers should act i see like people should listen to that (laughs) and imitate it like the idea because she's 100 percent right that a video is not the same as a live performance and the uh and she's 100 percent right that a lot of people who are the gatekeepers are not uh don't have their ear to the ground right and it's also there's also a limited amount of time for people to to figure this out but anyways but but of course this has always been true right commerce and they and they i guess my defense of this system would be this just to play devil's advocate would be that there are worse systems um (laughs) even even in this even in this world like for example like let's say the 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 unfairness of the fact that you like know your friends and that's the safety you're 100 percent right in your analysis but let's look at improv okay in improv it's not events you Mm -hmm. have to pay a couple thousand dollars before you even get to go on uh you know have the opportunity to be on stage it is literally a paid for play situation so it's i'm not saying you know i would i would argue that is a worse uh right I'm saying to you that I don't think that it is 
is about dismantling this process of like let's say your friends booking you right I think it's a matter of the gatekeepers being aware that that is the situation you want like a rating system no 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 the opposite the opposite but I'll say you know for example I know for a fact that there are bookers who book comics especially women and people of color whom I book without coming to watch the show just because they're like Louisa booked them they will probably work in my you vetted them yeah I see but here's the thing. I like to gamble sometimes. I'm, I haven't seen how's it going to work out. I also have a low stakes room where I don't have a minimum drink number that I have to sell or tickets that I have to sell. So I can take these gambles whenever I want to. Mm-hmm. But the fact that person whose job it is to have their ear to the ground wants to shortcut that process and just be like, this person's sign off means this person can do this job well, if they were on your show twice but, but on the <laughs> fair fair maybe. that's a totally yeah. that's totally true but on yeah. the another way to look at it is that like you have a good reputation and right. you've and that's a reputation that's earned yeah right you didn't you didn't get that through luck or through whatever right. and once you have a good reputation and a trust yeah that people who have a limited amount of time will lean on you right. and that makes you more influential and powerful and you know i again i think there's worse ways to I and, know. and and like you know i've covered a lot of different forms of entertainment mm-hmm. and trust me there's bad gatekeepers and right. every one of the, and there's uh and the commercial the the, the commerce versus art discussion mm-hmm. is prime and I mean, in a weird way, there's on the level of com- live comedy shows, there's less financial stakes than in others. Because there's less overhead. There's less overhead. Yeah. I mean, that's true for all stand up. I mean, that's, this is why when HBO started, you know, the first thing they started doing besides sports was stand up. Uh-huh. And when Netflix really started putting all their money in stand I mean, the fundamental reason is it's, it's cheap. cheap, right? Yeah, that's a good point. It, when Fox really started going into entertainment, they, uh, there was a lot of stand up shows they put on. And it's just, that's the advantage that stand up always has. Yeah, I see. Of being cheap to produce. Of being cheap to produce. Well, but I mean, you can't address that part without addressing the fact that, you know, as somebody who's very bitter about all the grad school I've gone to, the reality is that comics are doing up to 10 years of professional training, unpaid, making money for venues that are making money off of them by selling drinks, by selling whatever. So it's not, there is this weird disconnect between, between being like, art and commerce are always an issue when we're not looking into the labor and how the labor has to be developed to a certain point before you can not even just fairly, but sustainably make money off of them. Right, right, right. right. You know, this, um, this conversation about gatekeepers, I had a com- I had a conversation recently with someone who was a former Broadway dancer and is, was working on investing in a new Broadway play and told me that there are basically three people mm-hmm. in New York city who own almost all of the Venues. Yeah. Wait, uh, uh, Broadway. Broadway. Yeah. Yeah. Well, because well, Broadway is ultimately not a theater business, it's a real estate business. Yeah. Right? So you have Ju Jamson, you have the Schuberts, and you have. Um, See, I, I didn't even get yeah, that. That's, far. Yeah, that's. Broadway, what defines Broadway is the size of the theater and where it is. Yeah. It's not how good the shows are or how right. they. So there's no curatorial voice over no, well, Broadway. <laughs> yeah. Cause I mean, it was interesting. Yeah. We were having a conversation. I, I'll get us back on yeah. the comedy in a moment, but we were having a conversation about this. And it was, I was, the, to me, this, and of course, for her, that was just, that's the air. Like it's just, right. just that's the way, you know, that's just the way mm-hmm. it is. And I was just like, well, you know, she's like, well, you know, who buys Broadway tickets is like, you know, kind of affluent white women. Yeah. You know, so on. I was like, but they become self perpetuating. Right. If you just make things for affluent white women. And, right. And this is actually the thing that I wanted to address about this. Like that's, right. that's how it is. Yes. Right. So again, I don't really feel like it's, we have to change the system, but it's more of these people taking more responsibility for what they're doing because, you know, I understand a club booker, let's say booking Steve. <laughs> not sorry, Steve, if you ever hear this, you know, but like, uh, <laughs> I hope he does. <laughs> <laughs> I hope or, he does. Like, or Stormy Daniels, who just right. got booked to do this right. like speaking engagement at a comedy club and this kind of thing. So business wise, we understand the comedy mm-hmm. club's choice to do this, right? But there is this complete negligence over the fact that we are responsible for what audiences think comedy is when they come to our venue. And what I mean by that is like, especially at clubs, it drives me crazy because especially at clubs, most of the women at clubs are there on a date with a man. And a lot of the times they're there for the first time ever, not just women, but a lot of people, you know, they go to see comedy 
once a year, tops. Like it's not a thing they do regularly. So if you go to a comedy club and you bring your girlfriend and it's seven white dudes of approximately the same age, dressed kind of the same, all talking about my wife is like this and I hate my boss and whatever all your jokes are about, you can progressively see the women's faces just like completely losing interest. And, and not just the women, but people who don't identify with those six white dudes on stage, you know? And by the time they leave, they don't walk out thinking, I wish there were more diversity. I wish somebody had reflected a point of view I identified. They walk out thinking, I don't like comedy. Yes. This was not fun. I don't want to come back next time. And so there is this point where we're making the consumers of comedy, where mm-hmm. we have to teach them. And so like, it's, it's something I try to address with the way that I book in terms of like, I will give you what you want. I'll give you some headliners that you want to come here and see, but I'm going to put in there some people that you've never heard of mm-hmm. that you're going to want to walk out saying, I want to hear more from this person that will be a surprise laugh because it was a point of view you never thought you would identify mm-hmm. with. And that makes people who are good comedy fans, who now know that there's different styles and different <clears throat> types, different levels, and will be able to understand that if I saw something and I don't like it, it's okay because I can find something I do like. You know, <laughs> you know? I'm gonna, I, I don't often plug other episodes on oh. an episode, but I'm going to make a plug for the a recent episode with Jen O'Donnell. Okay. And first of all, I think both of you should know Jen O'Donnell, Mm -hmm. but she has, so she has a podcast called like take down the patriarchy, but she also does a women's only show in LA at West side called ladies room. Oh, okay. And she and I had almost this exact conversation, which about the audience. And then also how, if you are a woman Mm -hmm. among those six men, yeah. How it's how difficult it is to work through new Absolutely. material. And so ladies room is designed to to be beneficial yeah. in both in both ways that you can yeah. try out new stuff and so on. And so yeah. I think it's um I actually went to a show recently it was outstanding and it it was a little different. Yeah. You know, and it was um I did fun. I ran um all women or mostly women show at New York Comedy Club for a while that's also in LA yeah. uh Witch Hunt. Oh I yes, uh, Meryl yeah. Davis. Yes. Yeah, exactly. And I ran it probably like 2 years and one of the things that was the most interesting observation probably that I made in that time was, you know, in New York, because there's so many clubs and venues that you could do stand up, the majority of comics, especially if they're headliners, have multiple spots in one night. So you have to schedule them right. And then usually they are running in five minutes before their spot and running out as soon as they're done. Mm -hmm. Right. What I found in a mostly women's show is that the women, even when they had other spots, they always made sure to show up at least one or two performers before they went up. Every single one, almost every single one works on jokes in the room. Like they stand in the back and they're going over their set and they're listening to what this person is talking about and making notes and adjustments before they go up. Right. And every man I booked on that show ran in and out because their attitude is my comedy is my comedy. It'll be funny wherever. And I could just walk in and be funny. Right. Whereas women, I think, are already conditioned to probably being the only one on the lineup. I'm going to have to pick up on the tone of the room, address it, see how much I have to talk about whether I'm a woman or not, make sure that I reference the previous comic. Like they have to do, pull out every stop to make sure that they can win over the audience and they're ready to do that. And some great comics, I saw some great comics, male comics bomb on this show because they walked in, not, they took no pulse of the room. They didn't realize that they were like rudely contradicting what a comic just said, you know, that kind of thing. So that's what's changing for them is that they have to now adjust to having to be one amongst the lineup of different people, as opposed to we all do the same kind of stand up. here. Yeah. Where you have to be more aware of the context. Yeah. It's super interesting. I want to talk to Jason a little bit about, and this is, this is beyond just stand up. This is about comedy more generally. It was something that I picked up in your Letterman book that I had been tuned into with um, with Chappelle and Neil Brennan. So again, I'm now I'm shamelessly plugging a different <laughs> episode, but I interviewed Neil Brennan. Oh, um, cool. It was a fantastic conversation. Yeah, and I actually give a talk where I talk about about Neil's three mics, and mm-hmm. I talk about how Neil's like the funniest person you don't know, right. kind of thing. Like that he, you know, is this incredible joke writer. You know, the guy behind the guy. You know, Chappelle's show doesn't exist without Neil. A lot of people know him now, though. Now, now yeah. they know yeah, him. Right. Well, and they know him now, I think, in part because he tried to be a stand-up like his buddies Chris Rock yeah. and Dave Chappelle, and he didn't have he didn't have their likability. 
And not so, just that, but there was also, from what I was speaking about earlier, he was perceived by some of his peers as uh, skipping the line in I certain see. ways and not putting in the time to develop as an open micer, let's say, and to go, especially, you know, he has an older brother, Kevin Brennan, who's a stand-up. Uh, I did not know that. Yeah. So Kevin yeah. is probably like 15 years older, I want to say. I don't know if that's he has, He's like the youngest of like of 10 a bunch kids. of kids. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Kevin was an established road comic who worked at the store and all of this stuff. Who, I see. Who got him the job, got Neil the job as a door guy at the club. Okay. And that's where he met Chappelle uh-huh. and was like, I'll write this thing with you. So he found success first through writing with Chappelle uh-huh. and then was like, I'm going to do stand. Yeah, <laughs> and so it is this like Steve-O problem of like, you are trying to translate fame and success in one area into shortcutting, getting on big stages. I see. Which he eventually earned their respect, I would say. But at the beginning, it was a little bit. And Kevin is still pretty bitter about it. <laughs> is that right? Yeah, because he was doing it for a good, like, 12 years before uh, Neil ever started. And now Neil's more famous. <laughs> yeah, I see. Because, you, know, you know, what I thought what Neil did well was he pivoted in right. terms of, th- you know, taking a, a weakness and making it into strength with three mics where he, you know, to, if you watch three mics on Netflix, he, he splits time between three mics, uh, um, one-liners, traditional stand-up, and mm-hmm. what he calls emotional stuff. And the emotional stuff is the best part of the show by oh, far. Oh, really? I disagree. Oh, I thought it was by <laughs> far the best part. It's just yeah. riveting. Okay. Not comedic, but right. riveting. Yeah, exactly. And, and, but it works well together. You get these palate cleansing moments and so on in a case. But what I liked about learning about Letterman more was to me, the star of the book was his ex-girlfriend and producer Marco Meryl Marco. Marco. Marco right to me I found like that to be the most interesting element of the book yep. could you talk a little bit about about that because I think like Letterman's not Letterman in the way that Chappelle's not Chappelle right without I these say, two people no I mean, I that's I'm, I'm I'm pleased that you say that because that's definitely one of one of the ideas I'm I try to get across in the book which is and it, I wasn't the first person to point out that Meryl Marker was important. She was the first head writer. She was, uh, you know, she came up with stupid Petrix. She came up with, but I really tried to. But even like writing jokes and stuff put, for him at the, um, at, before that she wrote jokes for him for yeah. sure. But then, and what I tried to do is sort of put meat on the bones of this idea that why she was as mu- a, a co-author of, his success, which, you know, to do that, you know, sir, I first had kind of define what his success is. Okay. And so the book is a biography of Letterman, but that, you know, first of all, is disproportionately focused on his 80s material, which is because that's when his real, his real reputation is built on this period where he's doing a lot of innovative things that are very, that's the period that where he's very influential and he's known for, for sort of breaking the form and deconstructing the form. And, you know, they had this very, you know, copacetic artistic relationship where she was sort of this heady person with an art background, went to Berkeley and he was this middle American, you know, guy from Indiana. And she was very confident as a performer and where she wasn't. And she, he was not a very productive writer where she was an incredibly prolific writer. So together, and I think his incident, one of the kind of questions I began with in the book is how does this guy who revered Johnny Carson, which is the sort of common wisdom about it, this revered the most traditional late night performer of the day end up being this kind of radical revolutionary uh, performer? Yeah, so and, much so that he doesn't become the next Carson. Right. But even before he's part of this, because he's known for being kind of the anti Carson for so long. And I think the, uh, the answer to a good degree, good bit of degree is Marco's influence. So, but you know, both of my books are, and to some extent, even on my journalism, you know, there's like a few things that I fundamentally believe that are kind of snaked through all of them, which is, you know, I, the, a lot of critics and historians see art through a kind of auteur lens. Which is that, you know, we'll look at all these movies through, you know, look at what the, who the director is. And then you see all the director's movies and you find, you know, the things he has in common. And then you zero in on those. And certainly there's no more auteur genre than talk show. Every, most Mm -hmm. people who write about talk shows, if you're writing about Seth Myers, you're writing about Seth Myers. If you're writing about um, Samantha B, you're writing writing about Samantha B. When the reality is these are deeply collaborative forms. Mm -hmm. And to understand 
how, you know, why you see on screen is the way it is. You have to not just look at the writer's room, which is certainly something you have to look at, but you also have to look at the production staff and how the organism uh, operates. And if you let them in, what I discovered through reporting is that, you know, the, the, the structure of that show really changed over three decades and its success or failure had a lot to do with how it was organized. So I think a, a huge amount of its early success and its DNA has to do with, uh, with Marco. Yeah, one of the stories that I liked a lot about it was Dave was a pretty terrible actor. Yeah. Like he wasn't good at doing sketches, which you <laughs> might expect from that kind of show. And so she started putting him kind of in live action situations, like interacting with the public. Am I remembering this correctly? Yeah, although I think there was also an idea of that he not only was he a better, but he didn't he didn't like acting. Okay. And both of them had this sense that real people can be funnier than actors. And I think in a lot of ways, they anticipated reality television and the kind of world of remotes that Conan did. Did they did. invent the man on the street thing? They, they didn't invent it, but they, yeah. they kind of mainstreamed it and they were the first like Steve, the, 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 Steve Allen did a few man on the street things yeah. but they had some canned act they had some you know some contrived stuff so they were the first ones to really make it a, a great art form which was then sort of picked up by the Daily Show and Conan and all these places and now it's just seems like a part of the meat and potatoes of late night but but Mer Letterman but more specifically Merrill who was the author of those remotes directed by Hal Gurney really created those remotes out of one as you put it like a, a solution to a problem. How do we get yeah, around the fact yeah. that he's not, which is, you know, it's funny because now you look at this late night style, people like someone like Fallon and like he's somebody who the argument for Fallon is that he could do everything, right? He can, he's a, he mm -hmm. could act, he can tell That's jokes, right. he can sing, whatever. Where Letterman was of actually a very narrow performer and very limited. Yeah. His talents were nar narrow and I would argue deep where um, today it feels like people like Corden and Fallon and these people there, they have a wide variety. Yeah, yeah, of a little jobs. more showman like. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're, they're song and dance. And, and, and Letterman's and part of that was Letterman's background as a radio like weather, DJ weather or host guy. and you know, and so on. So he would be, he yeah. would do call-ins and so yeah. he had kind of cut his teeth as, as a younger performer. Yeah. Yeah. You, it's like there wasn't his first, there wasn't a TV when he, in his house when he was born. I mean, we forget that like TV is like not that old. So the, uh, the first stars that were he radio, knew were radio yeah. stars. Yeah. So, you know, Bob and Ray and, and these people that, that, that was who he really emulated. So his, even, so his first jobs were radio jobs. Mm -hmm. And I think that does pro now with podcasting, we're kind of going back to that. Yeah, it's fascinating. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, I think, cause I think it produces different strengths. Yeah. yeah. And then if you just focus in some ways, I feel like I, I argue that like Letterman's one of the strengths is, is language. He's got a real great sense of language. And I think a lot of that comes from radio. I see. That's interesting. So I, I want to ask you about how you, so you, you were talking about interviewing earlier, right? You're interviewing people. You're talking about when you were a telemarketer and so on. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's the main takeaway. I want. Well, you look, you know, if anyone's a job out there, I, <laughs> My rates are low, but I expect a lot of commission. I, I just yeah. want to make this observation in case it wasn't mm -hmm. obvious to you or anyone else listening is you were, you were really good at selling subscriptions. Theater subscriptions. Oh, oh it was theater. I thought it was, I thought it was magazine subscriptions. No, no. Theater subscriptions. Theater, yeah. okay. to, to seasons, theater seasons. Wow. Okay. That's big bucks. So you're selling art. I'm selling art. And in fact, my, my I mean, I, I don't want to, I could talk all day about this. They, uh, yeah, I had a lot of theories about what sells and what doesn't. And I would make sure to know as little as possible about the things I was selling. Okay. I found that made it harder to sell well. That's funny. Anyways, but I don't want to take up time. Oh, no. But when, so, so I want to, like, is there, and, and please, as an anthropologist, mm -hmm. Is there an art to interviewing people? I'm asking partly, partly for myself as someone <laughs> oh who's my de God. developing some, some, Yes. Trying the answer is yes. There's, so, okay. a, there's no, there's no part of my job that's harder and that I have more, that I learn more on a day to day level and I have more to learn. That's the most complex one thing that I think people who don't do th this job don't understand that. Yeah. Being a writer is hard and yeah. writing, thinking critically is hard, making arguments hard, but it is endlessly complex. And it's just like anyone who's been on a first date knows this. Like, mm -hmm. like there is this sort of, you're, you're reading each other yeah. and you're trying to figure out what things, but it also has to do like, for your, I mean, listening is such underrated. underrated so yeah. people are, we're all 
we all can be better listeners. Absolutely. Like, and it's What'd not. What did you say? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's uh, bad, bad, bad yeah. hack. You want a hack um, move. <laughs> <laughs> you were saying, yeah. yeah, no, I No, I, I agree. Because um, the only thing that I could think of as an anthropologist, because we do interviews, right? But um, I would say it's probably with a different aim than mm-hmm. both of you do interviews. Um, I would still say the thing to take away from anthropology in terms of talking to other people is always keeping in your mind, not out loud to the person you're interviewing, but in your mind, always being very aware of the limitations of your point of view and making sure that whatever, you know, it is, it's part of this how to responsibly represent others kind of ethos that comes with anthropology now that they didn't have a hundred years ago that says that our impression of this conversation is limited by the knowledge I came here with, what the goal was mm-hmm. that I had in mind in this conversation, what the power dynamic is between you and I, mm-hmm. and using all of that to frame what your representation at the end is going to be of this other person in this conversation. I see. Okay. I'm trying to think about how I can be better at this. With that, <laughs> with that in mind. I mean, certainly yeah. the, one of the things that I find mm-hmm. as a, as, no, I mean, I, part of the reason I chose to do the podcast right. was because it was a new skill. Sure. Ah. Like I was usually on the other side, mm-hmm. the right. person teaching, giving yeah. talks, being interviewed and so on. Like I was just like, Oh, this will be different. And it yeah. is. I think how to get interesting things out of people. Mm-hmm is very complex and each person is a different key okay, right so, so some people you just ask a question oh what's and they'll well, just go and, and go, they'll go. <laughs> and some people yeah. it's like you gotta some people gotta be really contentious i find yeah. sometimes you, there's certain kind of person that you actually have to be confrontational to get yeah. their respect like circle talkers yeah, so yeah. You, you have to you have to some certain people you have to make you yeah. have to anyways there's all that, yeah. that's and that you know podcasting i'm sure we all listen to more yeah. podcasts than we did obviously five or whatever ten years mm-hmm. ago that uh, you you can tell some people are really bad at it and some yeah. people are really good at it. You know, I actually listened to Howard Stern in preparation for this. Like, I was like, oh, who's yeah. good at interviewing people? Are you going to have a stripper come on at this point? <laughs> is there going to be a... <laughs> Yeah. I, what about? I'm curious. Could we talk about Bubba the Love Sponge? <laughs> Since uh, he recently mentioned uh, the, you, you saw it on Twitter. Oh yeah. Remember that Bubba the Love Sponge in defending. Uh, uh, Tucker, Tucker Tucker Carlson, Carlson. Yeah. mentioned Me- the benign violation the, theory. Which he wrote a whole book on the benign <laughs> violation theory. And now, correct me if I'm wrong. I thought he completely d- uh, described it incorrectly. Um. But but. The, <laughs> And do you want because you, science being used you for came evil? up with a theory to, de- to define all of comedy? You, you came up with a theory, all of comedy, the and you used Bob and the Love Sponge hey, you know, in a, the Wall Street Journal, yeah. used your theory. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I thought he described it incorrectly because the way he said it was, was that he was like, oh no, Tucker is, is harmless because comedy is about vi- transgressing, but. It's it's uh tra- it's a benign transgression because it's a comedy as opposed to what I ex- what I thought your point was is that it's comedy if it is benign violation right. that if it's if it's too if it's not benign and then, then it's, it no longer it's, if you go up to someone whose mom yeah. just died and you're like you know, you make a joke about her mom just dying at a funeral yeah. that's not funny right yeah. Yeah. so that that's what I thought the benign part of benign violation was I I think he I think so so yeah so for for people who don't know this there was an op, an op ed an opinion piece in the Wall Street Journal about a recent mm-hmm. like, unearthed tapes or something of Tucker Tucker Carlson Tucker yeah. Carlson calling into this show. Tucker Carlson said some offensive stuff. He says some, on his show, and Bubba Lozano defended it using the benign violation yes, theory, which he right. wrote about. It's all covered. Now yeah, explain yeah, it. Okay. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. Yeah. So first of all, I was not going to get into that conversation on Twitter. <laughs> like I'm like 140 Why characters. Not? Here's, here's, here's the lesson on interview. Turn the table. So now turn the table. I should have put an Amazon link to the book. So I think what what got missed there is the notion. So so what you know what we end up saying is that that things that are funny are wrong yet okay, are threatening mm-hmm. yet safe, don't make sense yet make sense, and we use this term benign violation. So it's if you have an, a Venn diagram, it's this sort of overlapping, the sweet spot, right? Where this you simultaneously can see both what's wrong and what's not wrong about right. what's happening. Right. The challenge with with comedy is um, finding that sweet spot. Is yeah. finding the sweet spot, and the reason that it's hard to find the sweet spot is lots of things affect the sweet spot. So the amount of the amount of alcohol you have, the person sitting next to you, the how dimly lit the room is, 
whether the room is in a church or in a classroom or in, in a cellar of a bar, which yeah. is where we are right now. But most importantly, what is wrong and what is okay depends wholly on the values and perspectives of the audience. Right. Right. So their belief system in short, yep. right, which is influenced culturally and, and, and so on. So what happens is when you defend something that's racist, let's say, or sexist, and you say, well, these people were laughing, hence it's a benign violation, right. or that transgression was meant to be playful or meant to be in fun, and thus it's comedy, may be true, right? Like the intentions were this wasn't a serious thing. That's a great way to take a violation mm -hmm. and make it benign, and a great way to point out that something is a benign violation is to show some group of people laughing at it. The problem, of course, is that there's another group of people. But I'm just wondering very simply, it, did Bubba define <laughs> that accurately? And I would say on his face, no. no. Forget all that. Yeah. I'm just saying he defined benign violation theory one way, which is because it is comedy, it is benign. That's wrong, right? No, no, no. That's right. So we differentiate comedy, which is an attempt to That's make what I was going to say. Is something intent humorous is, uh, part of from this. something yeah. that is actually humorous, right? I mean, first of all, you don't need comedy to make something humorous per se, right? You have right, unintentional right. comedy, mm -hmm. you know, that but sense. how come you didn't speak up about when Bubba? This is like the most high-profile <laughs> use of your Brian Riley's in theory. How come <laughs> you didn't say get Bubba? Down to it. This is you're yeah. totally wrong. You're you're co-opting my phrase for yeah. the for wrong ends. It's a good point. I, I you know I I mean, and where should I have done that? Should I have written written in a the letter? Yes, first of all, it would have gotten you press. It would be good. <laughs> yeah. It would have sold some books. And it's not, I've been on Bubba the Love Sponge show. I, guess really? I, I have been on Bubba the Love Sponge and I promoted Letterman. He ambushed me. Uh, so, you, so okay. Yeah, I, I didn't. Honestly, I had a busy day. I didn't. Oh, really didn't oh man. <laughs> but I. Um, anyway. Uh, I'm sorry look, but, this, I, but you know, I will it. tell you this. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that happened. Okay. Here's why I'm happy it happened. Okay. Is because I think 10 years ago, he would never have been able to even make that argument. That's true. Because he wouldn't even know what makes things funny. Even flawed, right. even his flawed interpretation of it right. is that we were, we, so unfortunately I didn't have a hidden mic on, but <laughs> we had like a 30 minute conversation while we were waiting for this room to, to thing and to, to become available. But one of the things that we were talking about is this notion of like the science of comedy or an mm -hmm. academic approach to comedy right. seems to have bubbled into some, I mean, I wouldn't say popular, but like, a broader group of people than it yeah. was before. Yeah, I think um, actually to reference our previous conversation also. Um, By the way, did you notice how Jason got all contentious with oh, me? Did he? In order to oh, did he? Oh, right now? To, no, he was trying to nail you down, <laughs> circle talker. I know. I was like, this podcast is getting boring. I need to spice it up a little bit by inserting some conflict. I've only just gotten started. Uh, <laughs> well, we have a few minutes, so. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, you were um, saying. I forgot. What was the thing you were Sorry, saying? about how like um, the kind of academic approach to comedy oh, right, has right. become... Sure, right. sure. Yeah. Um, I mentioned to you guys that um, when I started um, going to see live comedy a lot, really regularly, um, it was with this intention to meet comedy fans. So they're people who I thought loved comedy the way that I did. And what I ended up finding was that most comedy fans are fans of particular comics and maybe their extended circle. And that the people who love comedy as an art form, the way that I do, the vast majority chose to become comics. Like they love the process and the art and the final product. And at some point that switched into, well, that means I should try it <laughs> and I can do it and I can be better than these people I'm seeing that are not good in front of me. And then with this whole like bu comedy bubbles that have happened a few times, as everybody calls them, or even let's say with the resurgence of comedy on the internet and self-made stuff and podcasts and all of that, suddenly a portion of those people who love comedy in that way, instead of becoming performers, took an academic or like a very deeply critical tack into looking at comedy. So that I can remember a time when there were no people who cared to have an in-depth discussion of like one album versus another or things like this in the way that like music nerds talk to each other right. or film nerds talk to each other until very recently when now there are not just like real academics writing books and having these conversations but part of the success of podcasts I think is this this like rise of those fans who want to know about the process and think very deeply about it which is really strange because to performers right. a lot of them are very against this idea of overthinking comedy, right? Like they think that that 
sucks the magic and the juice out of it. But for some of us, the magic is in digging deep into what makes it funny. For some, I think, I think what's, I think it's, it's an interesting question whether the, the boom in academic theories on comedy have, have infiltrated comedy. I think yeah. there's a, a, lo- a lot of arguments I would say against that. But if you were yeah. to build one, and say that it is, I would point to Hannah Gatsby because mm-hmm. here is a, obviously a much talked about, uh, comedy special that has built into it a th- analytical theory about what comedy is. One, as it happens, I don't necessarily agree with, yeah. which is, and this gets, this gets to, d- to introduce more conflict because I really did like your book. But I do, I do disagree. I don't, I, I see comedy as an art and I could never, I would never say all of, you couldn't boil theater down into a formula, the benign violation. You couldn't do that. Yeah. You couldn't boil a uh, visual art down to that. So while I think the benign violation, if my, my opinion is, it's a very useful idea. Mm-hmm. It's true for some comedy or it's a useful prism yeah. uh, to analyze it. But since I, there, I could give, I could give you a hundred examples that don't fit this theory, just like I can give you many examples that don't fit Hannah Gatsby's theory. But I'm very fascinated by both Hannah Gatsby's mm-hmm. theory of that comedy is about building tension, then you have to release it. Right. And yeah. your theory about benign, they're, they're both these grand unified theories that intellectual analytical minded people are, yeah. are, it's fun to play with, right. but there is a difference between the intellectual life and the artistic life. And I agree 100%. It, and I think a lot of comedy, first of all, is intellectual on different grounds, but also a lot of it is instinctual. Right. And, and I think, you know, the, it's the job of critics and academics to try to understand this stuff. But I think it's, and there is a, there's a certain kind of comedy that is very mathematical. You know, but I, I do sort of believe that it is impossible to ultimately wrangle down an art form. Into- well, let's talk about um, the temporality of art. Have we we've talked about this before? I feel like I bored you with this in Denver, maybe. <laughs> but so as an anthropologist, I did actually focus on like modern American culture mm. and then specifically through the lens of the artist and mm. like production of art in America. And one of the biggest things that I was very concerned with, and I think part of the reason that I am as into stand up as I am is this theory, uh, that I guess I have <laughs> about the temporality that's attached to different art forms, right? So there are a couple of different ways the temporality matters for art. One is the amount of time that it takes to produce it, right? Mm-hmm. From concept to final product. And the other is the amount of time that it takes for an audience to take it in and have a response, right? Mm-hmm. And then there's also the temporality of the artist taking in that audience response and adjusting their future work, right? Mm -hmm. So the slowest art form, I would venture to say, is probably sculpture, right? Um, It's probably the reason that there's so many arguments around America right now about taking down old sculptures is because the slowness of sculpture as an art form means that if you're a sculptor and something happens in society and you have an idea, it could be six months to two years (laughs) before you're done with your sculpture, right? Then it'll sit in your garage or your studio or whatever for many years until you matter or there's a park where they want to put it. And then it gets put in public view probably a decade after it was created. So that now this is an art form that's referencing an idea that is not part of the temporality of this society who's observing, right? They're always going to have to observe it through this lens of this is an old idea. Mm -hmm. Now, and obviously they have the slow response time of... That's why sculptors tend to sculpt in one single ch- style without changing throughout their lifetime because there's not that many points in which feedback. feedback. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, it's right, built right. into their work. Right. Now, it's... Bird poop. Is yeah, the, uh... <laughs> exactly. And so, I mean, literally, the feedback is 100 years later, white supremacists are going to be fighting with somebody else about whether or not to take this down. You know what I mean? Right, right. So, the fastest temporality, I think, you know, the reason I started observing stand-up so deeply is because I think it has the fastest temporality in all three of those... Uh, scenarios, which means that I get to observe these processes more quickly than I would in an yeah, art form, right? So in stand-up, there's the idea can happen today. Something happens on Twitter today and you get up on stage tonight. Mm-hmm. And not only do you already have a joke or the beginning of a joke with that, but also off the cuff remarks, you know, like things in the moment, you get immediate feedback from the audience as to whether they groaned, they liked it, they laughed, mm-hmm. you lost them at the end, whatever. And then usually, especially in New York, you can get off stage and go right back on on another stage and make those adjustments in the moment, right? Now, the negative temporality attached to that is the short shelf life, right? So because they are about addressing the present in the present and getting feedback in the present, even recording it and putting out a special is already like a dead form of the art. 
Do you understand me? It's already now a finished product that won't, you know, comics call it burning their material after they record right. something, then they stop doing it. There was this painter, de Kooning, this is one of my favorite painters, and he reminds me a lot of comics because he was obsessed with, he just worked on multiple art uh, paintings at once. Mm-hmm. And they would sit around in his studio, and as he was working on one, he would be like, oh, actually, this color would go great on this one. And then he would come adjust this one, right? And in an interview once, he was asked, when do you consider a painting to be finished? And he said, I don't consider it to be finished until it's sold, because then it doesn't belong to me anymore, and it's not a concept that can keep growing Mm -hmm. and keep being addressed. So painters are in this temporality that's somewhere in the middle. The most obvious thing with them is that most of them are not appreciated until after their death because Mm -hmm. their ideas tend to not be of the present but of the future in their field but there are some that operate closer on that spectrum to comics right with the like in action performance of their art and that kind of thing so why did i bring this up because of the temporality of like the short shelf life right of the benign violation theory works for me in terms of like i i think there's a very big difference between an accidental comedy and a crafted comedy. And while we could loosely apply a theory to both of those types of comedy, they are distinctly different because one is an active, like trying to find that sweet spot. And the other one is stumbling stumbling onto it. Right. And the whole work of being a stand-up comic is refining that sweet spot. Is finding exactly the same, like the perfect spot to stand. Right? And know, and knowing that it's shifting. And exactly, and that even when you find it, in a week it might not be there. In ten years, your CD will night, not find it. You know <laughs> yeah, I mean? exactly. With, yeah, yeah exactly. I've, you know, I've seen comics get upset. And yeah. audiences because they're oh, like, I know this is funny. biggest pet peeve on earth. I'm like, <laughs> how do you not see that that's you failing at your job? Again, just try again, buddy. <laughs> try again. <laughs> um, we're a little bit short on time. I, okay. I, but I wanted to make sure, I always end with the same question. Okay. And I have a feeling that both of you will have rich answers to this question, which is, what are you reading, watching, or listening to that re- is really good, that really stands out? Oh, my. You want to go? You go first. I don't, I don't know. I watch so much garbage. Um, I know we both liked Russian Doll. Uh-huh. Yes, I watched true. it twice already, too. And you had an interesting theory. I also had one. I almost responded. But so like, so we'll for the listener, tell us what Russian Doll is. Oh, Russian Doll is a series that has one season on Netflix. I'm starring Natasha Leone. I think she co-wrote it, right? Yeah, she Yeah, did. she co-wrote it. I was just listening to her on Fresh Air on the way here. Yeah. So I know that, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a, a time loop kind of scenario. Yeah. Um, Groundhog's Day kind of thing where Mm -hmm. she's reliving the same day over and over again but it's specifically very New York and very much about um, it's kind of like late 30s woman lifestyle in New York it's very very good okay Mm -hmm. it's like Sex in the City meets Groundhog Day oh my god it is it is is meets Groundhog Day but (laughs) not Sex in the City yeah Yeah. whoa Uh, maybe like grown up kids do you remember kids yes Yes. Yes. so it's kind of like a grown up character from kids that's true having a Groundhog's Day okay alright that's yeah. good. I Including seen Chloe Sevigny. Yeah. 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 What, yeah. what else? What else stands, stands out? So you want something that is really... You're, you're reading, watching, listening Let's see. To right you, now, right? I'm reading... I, ju- I've read, I just read Brett Easton Ellis's memoir, which is not good. Okay. I've read... I'm reading a <laughs> I'm good reading uh, history of a, va- of a vampire, of, va- of the vampire called va- uh, The Vampire, which is this English history, which is actually... Actually, that is quite good, but okay. I'm like... I'm a horror nerd, so that kind of thing. It's sort of like a pre-Dracula history of the vampire and I'm um, reading I'm reading through books I'm reading the, and I just uh, uh, Joan Rivers biography which oh, uh, cool. I think I need to read that yeah which I uh, that which I've uh, I've read the I've, I've read the I read the biography of her, but I've never, I didn't realize right. that she had actually written her own yeah. memoir. It's funny you say this because I just read Mar- uh, what is it, Diary of a Mad Diva which is a okay. book she wrote, uh-huh. one of her books. Yeah. Right, right, right. And um, yeah, it's like super laugh out loud funny and yeah. talk about taking aim at everyone. Yes, her no, documentary, the docu- her do- documentary about her was outstanding. Incredible. I mean, there's so many, been so many comedy documentaries in the past 10 years, but yeah. I'm not sure any is better than that one. So yeah, that's, uh, but then for, I'm trying to think about other things that are really good. 
You have nothing? <laughs> I, I mean, I've been reading this academic publication called Behind the Laughs. I forget the author's name, but he's an anthropologist as well. I was telling you about it before, Peter. Mm-hmm. I'm not that deep into it, but I don't love it already. <laughs> it's just kind of like a, a little bit of a shallow kind of investigation into the business of comedy Mm -hmm. and a little bit of what we were talking about commerce and at what point comics start making money and how clubs make money off of them and that kind of thing. But the author was very clear about his having spent about one year observing comedy before writing this uh, (laughs) term. Yeah. And I'm like, Oh, not into it. guy. You you know, I would say this, like, so as someone who came from this from outside, like someone Mm -hmm. who, you know, watched, Richard Pryor and Eddie Murphy yeah. growing up and used to watch Saturday Night Live and liked comedy and maybe fancied himself as being funny around the lunch table. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I got introduced to the world of comedy because I started trying to answer this question, what makes things funny? Right. And one of the first things I watched was the movie Comedian, the documentary Comedian about mm-hmm. Jerry Seinfeld going out on the yeah. road post Seinfeld. And for me, it was like someone had turned the lights on. Like mm-hmm. I had no idea what was going on yeah. behind the scenes. And so it may be the case that that book will be useful for, for others. For novices. <laughs> yeah, you know I mean? exactly. For, no. I mean, nowadays, I think, though, I of course, podcasts and there's other yeah. ways to find out about this. But right. at that time, like living in Boulder, Colorado. It's yeah. true. It was, it was an unusual. There weren't that many things like yeah. that. There weren't that many w- ways to figure yeah. out. There wasn't even like, if you if you hear Jerry, Jerry Seinfeld says this one thing, which is interesting. It shows you how much things have changed. That in 1975, there was a book that came out called The Last Laugh. I might be getting the name wrong. Anyways, mm-hmm. there was like no books about comedy. So it's not yeah. like when people say like, well, what, what really helped you become a comic? He always mentions this one book. And because he said at the time there were no books Nothing, about yeah. comedy. There was no books yeah. people describing what it's like to get on a bill. Yeah. And, set. and it's actually, it's held up pretty well. If I'm getting the name right, I hope so. But it's 75 and it's like, but all the comics of his generation talk about this one book. So yeah. it gives you kind of a behind the scenes of what it was like. You know, it was obviously a very different world. But. Yeah, but you know, it's not that different. <laughs> it's not in terms of like the the traditional angles and uh, networks and gatekeepers. There's just like more avenues, right, for people yeah. to come through. And it's, But it's just generally um, a problem, I think, of the fact that comedy, especially if you count all types of comedy in that term, then it's a giant iceberg and only like 1% yes, is really right. surfaced. And um, we all have different views, points of view on it. Literally, I mean, like we're all looking at a different side of this iceberg, uh-huh. but most people are not looking very far beyond the surface. No, you know? same way that people yeah. don't study how film yeah. is made or don't appreciate when they're watching a film all yeah. the connections to previous films all right i'm going to do something I, I usually end on that but i have two mm-hmm. qu- one question for each of you that, I, okay. that i've been meaning to ask i want to ask so I'll, I'll ask yours first jason which is so your your um kindle single searching for dave Chappelle, right was an investigation of him leaving Chappelle's show. Right. And then Chappelle has a recent comedy special where he talks about this, he, where he talks about the this book Pimp by the Iceberg Slim. Right, right, mm-hmm. right. And he tells the story of, is this ringing a bell? Yeah. I mean, I saw the special. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's so at he, the end of the second It's at the end of the second special. The and he, he, yeah. he, says, he's a, he, goes, he basically says, I'm not going to tell you why I left. I'm going to tell you the story instead. Right. And um, I, I want to, and so in the story, it's about a pimp from the seventies and his main prostitute, and she's going to leave, and he comes up with this over the top, mm-hmm. basically grift, right, where she thinks that he she killed a guy and all this kind of stuff, and then to get her not to leave, to get her to yeah. not leave. Thank mm-hmm. you. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm I'm cursed with knowledge yeah, right yeah. now. And so he tells this whole story. It's a fascinating mm-hmm. story. Yeah. It's not even that funny a set of things. And then he goes, and that's why, basically. And I just wanted to get your reaction as someone who probably has thought more about. Right, right. Chappelle's Interestingly, lifting. that is, that is a thing that he's been telling for many, many years. Oh, is that right? That was the one thing on that special that was not new. He's a, and you know, I wouldn't, Chappelle, when he returned from, you know, the truth is he never really went away. He was performing yeah. live constantly and he was talking about this stuff live and he was giving like a variety of cryptic answers. And, and I mean, the, the, the short answer is my feeling on why he left. You, you should read the Kindle single. I don't think that most of the answers he gives are accurate. Are, you are honest. Uh, are, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you guys said it. Just interviewers. I, I, I think I think it's I think there's a you know 
as to your point mm-hmm. that when you look at an iceberg, everyone's looking at it from a different angle. Yeah. When I did that piece, I didn't end up, I went, I went to Yale, uh, so you know, I went to Ohio where he lives, but I talked to as a wide variety of people, people who knew him when he was a kid, yeah. people who knew, and I, and, you, there's many different answers. There was my, the most intriguing piece of reporting I unearthed was his best friend in high school who went on to star in the real world. He was the, the African American guy, first guy got kicked out of the real world. His name's Kevin Edwards. He was oh, a stand up comic. Yeah. With, with Wait, the first jacket. guy to ever get kicked out of the real world was a black guy? Yes. Of course. Because he hit a woman? Which ins- yes, which, ins- oh, yeah. which ins- <laughs> oh my God. inspired the Chappelle yeah. Show sketch, the sketch on the, on the, the, roommates. the Mad yeah, Real the World. Mad real world. Which, oh, uh, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that guy who is, came up with Chappelle in DC, yeah. um, going back full circle, when there was a great local DC comedy scene, said that when Chappelle was like 16 or when he was like 14, very young, he was really obsessed with Bobby Fischer. Oh, yeah. And Bobby Fischer, famously, you know, at the height of his fame, mm-hmm. He's retired. Dis- disappeared. Uh, I see. And then he returned, right? And he had this kind yeah. of... Thing. But it's not to say that he was... It'd be too simplistic to say he Dave Chappelle was doing Followed yeah. by Fisher. Yeah. But what's fascinating is that he under he knew this history in his mind from way back this then. This might be a the power. power. It was a possibility. The and, power yeah. of disappearing. Yeah. And, the, you know, the objective fact of... of is that Dave Chappelle gave up, what was it, 40 million, whatever the salary mm-hmm. is, and he made, he, he went from being the biggest comic in America to something the way world. bigger. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so even from a purely financial point of view, that turned out to be a very savvy move. And so I think a lot of the political reasons, like the white guy who laughed at the wrong joke, yeah. he's given a variety of different reasons. You know, I'm not saying any of them are 100% wrong, but, but, mm, yeah. but, uh, th- th- I think the truth of it is that is, there, there's, again, it's, it's all, a little it's, bit of it's everything. All, it's, it's all in the book. It's all mapped out in the book. It's all mapped up in the book. And Neil Brennan gives a different answer than the Comedy Central yeah. people. But I, I, I think there isn't, it's not a, it's not a monocausal. There's not one reason for it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And you know, so as a psychologist, one of the things that we do in psychology is to try to find a, how X influences Y, but right. you, you know, but actually it's X1, X2, X3, mm-hmm. X4, X5. Right. It's, that behaviors, as we say, multiply determined. And right. So yes. I think yes. That's right. Um, well, thank you because I was curious about. Mm-hmm. I, I enjoyed that story a lot. It was so fascinating. I was like, oh, I wonder what Jason. <laughs> <laughs> the um, we thought you had talked about anthropology and being an anthropologist, and mm-hmm. as an anthropologist, how you kind of try to see, interpret the world, and turn off biases, or at least recognize them, and so on. I'm curious about your view uh, of the comic as an anthropologist. So you said you've got psychologists, mm-hmm. you've got sociologists, you have anthropologists. When I think about comics, I think they're more like anthropologists than they are like sociologists or psychologists per se. But I'm curious about your have you thought about this in this way? Do you think of yeah. the, do you think that the average comic would make a good anthropologist? I do with a whole lot of schooling. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, and and it's true. It's you know part of what drew me to them is that I do think that um, that's something we have in common is that we are types of people who are constantly like examining the world around us and our own position in it. I also think that we have in common that they center their own experience and uh, the limitations of that experience in what they're saying. They might make it more about them than anthropologists do, but they, the, that same acknowledgement is there. The only thing is that our driving goal ultimately is different. And so, you know, I used to say, like, we do the same thing, but I write 40 pages about your behavior and they write a pithy joke. And it's something I talk to comics a lot about is when they purposely choose an incorrect point of view because it is funnier than you being correct, you know, and we have some friends in common who are more like scientific comics who very much value using facts and teaching in their comedy. But there's that other end of the spectrum that's like, well, the it's the joke that matters. And if I have to lie or pretend or not acknowledge that this is flawed information to get to that punchline, I'm going to do that, which obviously an anthropologist would never do. Right. So I think that they are, a raw version of being anthropologists. 
and a lot and some of them are better than others in in terms of uh the observations that they make about the world one of the things that i'm currently not to say struggling with but like thinking about a lot is these two extremes that we're seeing in comedy a lot of the what comics call clapter comics have you heard that term no i haven't yeah clapter comedy is like pandering comedy that is like pc culture you know like uh, uses buzzwords about like People the new clap instead of laugh right I exactly they're they're acknowledging. Laugh. yeah, yeah they're like, right. we agree right. with you yes, exactly so there's that end of that which ah. you know um i don't think anybody would say is a high level of the art form comedy and then on the other end of that are the conservative let's call them comics who are like doubling down on not understanding uh, genderless uh, pronouns and you know um, siding with like well somebody has to speak up for this point of view that is clearly not something they believe in or agree with or think is right but they're hiding behind this idea of like funny is funny no matter what and not acknowledging the positive, like the possibly negative yeah, and just the, effects the of their words. Yeah. As you were talking about mm-hmm. earlier, like I, I've noticed that a little bit with kind yeah. of comics in their forties and fifties mm-hmm. and you're just like, all right, it's time to change. Yeah. You know, but it's also as interesting is that I was thinking about this recently about that, you know, this for a while that, you know, comics incessantly talk about political correctness I know. And, and how it's, they can't say these things, right? Which is, you know, com- completely historical. There's never been completely. a time where they can say more, more than they have, to yeah. a national audience than <laughs> right now, right? Like yeah. in the 50s, you couldn't say uh, hardly anything to a national yeah. audience, right? But, um. I believe Joan Rivers did stand up pregnant on TV and had to say she was, she had a bun in the oven because she couldn't say the word pregnant <laughs> is that on right? TV. Yeah. But, wow. but I think what's, what, what, what has changed in the last few years, and yeah. I'm thinking right, is that like, that, and this is partly because of Trump, but also people talking about political mm-hmm. so much that a market has opened up for people yeah. who are who, anti-PC, who are yeah. anti-PC. It's a very like, yeah. if you know, they you go on Joe Rogan and mm-hmm. that's in some ways as big a platform as any right of now. Course. And yeah. they go, you know, they, there's, there's places on the web that, that, you know, that incur that, you know, for this. And there's, and also it's not like they're, I don't think they're all disingenuous. Some, no. some, some are totally genuine. They and it is true do. that there is like social sanctions on certain kinds of points of views yeah. but I think what's happened is that like I, like I was looking at uh, Andrew Schultz right mm-hmm. who's like built up this YouTube yeah. presence based on being anti PC. Every yeah. one of his, you know, clips is in opposition to this. And, you know, if you just look at it, put it aside the politics of it. Yeah. It's just a new business model. Yep. It is absolutely. a, it's a business model. But it can- speaks to this problem of, um, you know, at what point is just getting butts in the seat enough, you know, like, right. and, and it's the problem of podcasts too, where there are, you know, we all talk about like, podcasts are the way for you to find your platform and your audience but without you also developing the skill set to be a good stand-up then you're asking people to come see you to do what you know what i mean so there's a spoken word yeah well i mean that's what happens to be an entertainer it it just it just makes you question the validity of having if there's an audience for this that means that it's worth doing Mm -hmm. and i don't think that's necessarily the truth but that's the model that we operate under in capitalism is if there is a market for this, then it must be worth doing. And, you know, I don't necessarily think that that's the truth. And it, there are, like you said, there's comics who are disingenuously doing it because they think this is a marketable way to proceed and like build an audience. And there's others because they believe in these points of view and are very sure that PC people are stopping them from saying things they want to say. But it's just, uh, it's a strange, strange time. Well, what's happened, right. Is that like, you know, if you don't have gatekeepers, right, yeah. which is true now increasingly that yeah. the gatekeepers, true, the, the reality is they're less powerful than they used to be. Right. That what what replaces it? Well, algorithms. Yeah. Right. If you look, at, if you can, the algorithms, you know, that you can get. That there, look, enough people who hate political correctness elected our current president. Right. So you, if you can get enough people. To, and if you have these systems which promote it, that kind of comedy, then that will be snowballs. Yeah. snowballs. And so, I mean, to me, it's sort of like, it's just self evident that like popularity doesn't equal quality. Yeah. Right. Uh, which doesn't mean anything about these specific people. Yeah. It's, I, but I do think what is popular and what is not popular is interesting. Absolutely. And, is, and I pay a lot of attention to it. And it's fascinating to look at, all right, how do people become popular? How do they not become popular? Well, how is it different now than it was five years ago? And it is. But I think that in a weird way, we went through a point when everyone sort of universally complained about gatekeepers mm-hmm. to a point now where I'm like, you know something? There were like, if you hear, if you hear Louisa talk, the amount of consideration she puts into her work and the amount of thoughtfulness. The curation is uh, the curation, term I like to use. And, 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 al- and algorithm doesn't do that or just. Mm-hmm. 
you know, the whatever the lowest common denominator is that yeah. will get attention. Well, algorithms don't have taste. Right. right. That's the issue. I think what we're we're getting down to fundamentally is this issue of taste and who has it and who doesn't and when and the people who have it can help spread it. And algorithms aren't as good at figuring out taste as much as it is they're good at figuring out popularity, which is you I think are pointing out are totally. independent. Yeah, and I think Perhaps. probably that's where well, the crux of my problem with most industry when I criticize gatekeepers, I think it is from this point, because I agree with you, they are less powerful and all this, but it, I perceive them mostly to be kind of floundering and trying to keep hold of what a little power they have yeah, yeah, yeah. through shortcuts and through pandering in some ways and instead of through a strong point of view and confidence in your knowledge of comedy. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, agreed. So, well, this, I knew this would be spirited and <laughs> smart. And I appreciate both of you bringing both your spirit and your smarts Are we going to gonna this, start a whole new podcast, podcast of the Watchers of Watchers of Comedy? Wow. <laughs> yeah. so, we'll Thank see. you so much for inviting us and having <laughs> yeah. us. Oh, this is really fun. Yeah, this is great. Thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for listening. Don't forget to visit petermcgraw.org for more information about our guests, show notes, and social media links. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and share with others. Join Dr. Peter McGraw next week for another fun, fascinating conversation on I'm Not Joking. Yo.